It was just a slow process of me regaining confidence, the fact that perhaps I could live and I might live a little longer. A and I didn't even notice it happening. I think this is one of the things about surviving, that it can reveal some of the illusions that we have about life and death um, and can give you a different standpoint on things that you can't see in normal life. It's a bit of a weird space, you know, that you've been brought this close and been saved, but you can't walk away and say, well, it's completely over. Every film that's ever written is about some hero's journey, overcoming something. But they, they always get to the point where you overcome it, and then they don't go on past that. Really, the journey starts after that for a lot of people. Well, I looked up across the river and I saw this balanced rock, you know, it was a rock balanced on another rock. There's a few of those around in the Arnhem Land Escarpment. Um, and I had this feeling of fear when I saw it, you know, like the rock was a warning. I saw what appeared to be a stick in the water ahead of me. And uh, I said to myself, I don't remember seeing that stick on the way up. A little bit closer, I saw eyes in the stick and I knew it was a crocodile. I thought it was going to be fairly close, but I didn't didn't think I would collide with it. And, and then as I swept past it, it uh, I felt this great bash on the back of the canoe and I realised it was attacking the canoe. And then I tried to jump into the tree and uh, as I was in mid-jump, you know, it was just like it all happened so fast, I just saw this sort of flash of teeth and water and it could grab me between the legs in mid-jump and pull me down into the water. Yeah, they swirl you, they whirl you around. It pushes water in, it's called the death roll, pushes water into your lungs uh, and knocks the stuffing out of you, basically, and, it's, uh, and then they just hold you under. I had entertained the usual doubts, you know, that this was a dream and it wasn't really happening. It's very hard to hang on to this, uh, this sense that you're, you're dying, I think. It comes as a very profound shock. Uh, and I would have died, I think, if the water hadn't been just a little bit too shallow for the crocodile. I tried to climb the tree again, and again the crocodile came back and grabbed me. Uh, I thought, I'm not food, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, I'm not food. I had to think about that a lot later. I, I thought a lot about uh, those thoughts that went through my mind at the end there, or what seemed like the end. But not long after that, it let me go again. So I tried to throw myself up the mud bank. I was getting pretty weak by this time, because I must have lost a lot of blood from the left leg. I was so focused on the crocodile, I didn't, uh, wasn't sort of paying attention to what was happening to my body. And then I found I could climb the bank by jamming my fingers into the mud and scrabbling with my feet. So I actually managed to do that, climb the bank and got to the top and stood up. And that was the most incredible moment when I stood up. I was like diagnosed one day and perhaps a couple of days later, I was in the hospital um, having, having my breast removed. What I remember before I went into hospital was standing in the shower washing myself, weeping. One does a lot of weeping. Anything I'd ever heard about breast cancer sounded like a death sentence. First one breast came off, then the other breast came off. And it was totally devastating. I'd go to work every day and walk around like a, like a hollowed person. And I couldn't think and I couldn't, there was no future. It was sort of, it was a strange situation to be in. But I was in this situation for uh, almost a year. Sitting in my backyard were 
two 36-foot hulls of a catamaran. I used to look at those two hulls and think, well, I didn't. I'd look at them and then look past them. It was just too, too difficult, too painful, and um, anyhow, I was going to die. And then one day, I thought, this can't go on. I put on my R.M. Williams riding boots, um, took the saw and the hammer, and I went out to this backyard. It was a huge backyard, like 10 acre backyard. And I kicked the hull of, of the boat. I kicked it with the boots. Then I got the hammer and I belted it with the hammer. And then I got my saw and I sawed a huge hole in it, which I afterward had to uh, fix. But, but that seemed to do it. I was right. And I started building a 36 foot ocean going catamaran. Which, you know, I thought, well, I can do this. I'd never sailed out of sight of land. So I did coastal navigation and celestial navigation. And I was a real hot gun on navigation. <laughs> That's what I thought until I actually got on the deck of my boat. And it was a total different kettle of fish. They cut all my stomach muscles, pulled out my bowel, chopped the foot of it off, joined the two ends back together, sewed me back up and stapled 36 staples into my, to my skin. I used to have a colon, now I have a semicolon. <laughs> and I have a scar to prove it. Thank you very much, I'm Alan Lovell. I was um, doing comedy, making people laugh about cancer and uh, Inside, I was feeling like this big, you know, um, like just fraud, you know, because I was, you know, wasn't feeling like that. I wasn't laughing. I wasn't a hero. I was really, you know, really fragile inside. You know, I just had this, you know, three-month-old baby. I had another child who was just nearly three and had a pretty, you know, <laughs> perfect sort of you know, situation, great relationship, you know, you know, things were going pretty well. And then all of a sudden, you know, you might have this, you know, you might have cancer. We, uh, Sue and I were in the doctor's rooms and, and I said, what's going to happen? Am I going to die? And he says, oh, well, we're all going to die, which was very sort of comforting. And uh, I said, yeah, but what's going to happen? He says, well, if it's in your lymph glands, you've probably got four years to live. If it's in your liver, you, you might have as little as six months to live. I just remember, it felt like my heart just hit the floor. And I felt like, this, this can't be happening. This couldn't be me. This is not my life. Luckily, it came out that it was, you know, it hadn't travelled through my lymph glands. When you get the, um, this brush with death, this, you know, this uh, short <laughs> use-by date, you, um, you just have all these uh, regrets that you haven't lived your life. You haven't lived, there's so much more to do. So I, um, yeah, I went about doing things, you know. I wrote and directed three short films. I put on a one-man show. I was, you know, was in two feature films. About two years after that, the, the wheels sort of fell off. And when I started to feel these feelings of, of um, depression and not feeling good about myself, I felt really guilty that I should have these, you know, why aren't I just, you know, so glad to be alive? Why aren't I just happy to be here? People faced death really well and you know, did all sorts of flamboyant, um, theatrical things in, in their last years of life and, and Certainly in the gay community, people completely reshaped what was acceptable at a funeral and, and, and how a funeral service could look and take place. You know, this was a group of relatively young people where there was a lot of death going on. You know, like I've seen people who were maybe a bit older or a bit more immersed in that scene who, who literally lost their entire social world over the next few years. Because I was going to travel in Latin America, it just seemed sensible to have the test. I don't think I had any reason to believe I was particularly likely to be positive or anything, but it just was a sensible thing to do. 
I guess getting a diagnosis like that when you're 22 must have brought a sense of, of mortality into focus. And certainly the stories of what could happen to you were pretty frightening. It was a pretty horrible thing to contemplate that, you know, you might either become demented and um, become unknown to yourself and your friends. I mean, to me, that was more horrific than becoming physically ill. Um, but I was also aware it was new and, and unknown. You know, I didn't make a decision that this was it and this was the end. And, and in fact, what I chose to do was to go ahead with the round world trip. You know, like, this was a real dream, to go and travel in South America. I had friends I'd talked about it with, and, and I guess I thought, well, OK, my choices are not to go, stay at home, be really careful, um, and hope that someone develops treatment, or just go and do what's important. So that's what I did. I'd rather um, speed things along by having a lot of fun than, you know, stay at home and wrap myself up in a, in a sterile bubble. Suppose I wasn't really seriously ill for a very long time, and you often, you often don't realise how ill you've been until after the event. So what had happened was I just started getting sicker and sicker, and then I woke up one morning and couldn't stand up, and um, half my face was paralysed. So that was, that was pretty bad. But then, then you, you know, you just focus all your energy on getting better. So I was in hospital attached to a drip. Um, and it was only afterwards that I thought, you know, I've been left in a pretty bad way. And I had to learn how to ride a bicycle again. Like, I literally lost my sense of balance. I'd be riding along and I'd look over my shoulder and it wasn't even like you'd wobble, I'd just fall straight over. So, I mean, who knows what the neighbours thought. I was riding back and forth up and down the street, falling over. The things that mattered to me were, were travel, learning, friends. The idea of saving up for a mortgage to purchase a house that would take 20 years to pay off just didn't seem very rational. I wrote up this wish list of things I would do before I died. The first thing on the list was to build this boat and, and uh, sail into the Pacific. Play a musical instrument to become a sculptor, and then I thought I'd like to do something for breast cancer. And the fifth was to write a novel. It was a wonderful list, and I've done every bloody thing on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken 20 years, but I've done every bloody thing on it. We wanted to talk to women all around Australia, so we set up this big adventure to go around Australia on motorbikes. We wanted it to be eye-catching. We wanted all the attention we could get because we were going to tell women that um, they were not to be fearful about this. They could know that uh, breast cancer wasn't a death sentence and, and they could have a fulfilling life afterwards. When I was really young, I used to sculpt little heads and things in clay, or plasticine, actually. But there was really no time for that. I, I had to, um, like, finish my education and then train as a dental therapist. And art uh, was sort of forgotten. You know, the most extraordinary things happen when you sculpt, things that you, you don't actually know what you're doing. Because I did these, these women, these large women, and they all had huge breasts. Uh, I have none. Both mine were removed. Now, I did love doing them. And there's a part of me in them. And, uh, and I acknowledge that. And I love it. As I struggled away down the river thinking to myself, oh, I'll have an interesting story to tell a few friends. I had absolutely no idea that it would be of interest to anybody. And, uh, I mean, actually not doing any interviews didn't stop the press, they just ran stories anyway. So I felt that, it, to some extent, my story was stolen from me, you know, by these, these attempts to impose another narrative on it. Well, there are several kinds of stories they were looking for. One of them was a rape story, I think, and because I was scantily clad. 
<laughs> one of those sorts of stories. It was heavily construed in sexual terms. In fact, there was a point, the most successful porno film of 1988 was um, called Crocodile Blondie. So yes, uh, the crocodile was a monster. I was the survivor and the hero or the heroine. That was another one. Yeah, I, I can't get into that one either. I don't like the master monster narrative, as I call it. It wasn't St George and the Dragon, you know. It's a pretty stock standard sort of expectation that people have that you're this hero survivor that's overcome this demon cancer and the story sort of ends. That's the climax, that's the hero's journey and then your life will be changed forever. But you're in this sort of void, struggling to try and grapple or grab onto some sort of story, some sort of uh, structure. That's what you're looking for, that you can pin your hopes to. That's how I felt when the wheels fell off, that there was no narrative. What you have to accept is that there could be changes to your body. Like, if you go back to early representations of people with AIDS, you know, there was the wasting and the lesions and the really, the really visible signs of illness. And it's always in the back of your head that that could be you. And I suppose I've been relatively lucky that by and large, people aren't going to pick it. And that, that, it's, that would be enormously stigmatising. So, so there is a bit of a sense of mistrust, you know, that you might wake up tomorrow and suddenly find your body's decided to telegraph this thing to the world in a way that you generally want it to. But, but I think I've been fairly accepting about, you know, a lot more accepting about ageing than, than other people might have been because I've always been prepared to accept a certain amount of loss of function or disability. When I went to hug people, I still stayed a 36B distance away from the people I hugged. And that was really strange. You know, automatically stopped that distance. I did get used to sort of bringing them in closer and that felt really weird because they were hard up against my rib cage and my bones. Um, and that took a wee while to get over. I started to mistrust my body and what it could do and what it's supposed to do. I, I gain a lot of confidence through my physical body and if it's not performing the way I think it should, well then I'll lose confidence in other areas, the way I present myself, the way I speak, the way I talk, the way I uh, hold myself. You know, all those things have a flow-on effect from you know, my physical body you know, breaking down. My work really changed course afterwards. I didn't see it for quite some time, but it really started to emphasise the power of nature and how, why, why we weren't aware of the power of nature and being deluded about that power. So I write, I write a lot about that now. Um, uh, and you know, I think this has got a lot to do with why we haven't, uh, why we don't take uh, account of the environmental crisis, you know, that we, we have this illusory sense of invulnerability. And, uh, we don't understand ourselves as ecological beings. We don't understand ourselves as embedded in an ecosystem. Because we think we're so totally special and apart and we're not, everything else is food for us, but we're not food for anything else. And I think the message was that this is an illusion and that we're, we're food like everything else. What happens is I go on the, the, there's breaks from the treatment and things start. After about six months, I have to go back on again. So I know I, I need to keep taking them. Like, I'm not going to live for very long without them. We didn't get a cure, but we got a set of treatments that improve things for many people, but not for all, and have a whole set of, as we now know, long-term side effects. I mean, for some people, they can't keep taking them. For a lot of people with HIV, they've gone from being young heroes facing death to sort of middle-aged people with chronic illness and with chronic poverty. And that adjustment has... I mean, it's, it's very difficult for some people.
You do tend to divide your life into before and after to some extent. Hmm. I don't want my life to be reduced to that event, but it was certainly an important event in terms of shaping the way I think about the world and the way I, what I do in the world. Yes, some people call me the crocodile woman as if this is the defining events in my life, and I don't see it that way, of course. Yeah, I've written some quite important books, so I get quite annoyed by people who refer to me as the crocodile woman as if this is the most important event, you know, that I've ever, ever, ever done. The thing about saying, you know, I'm a survivor, it places HIV in my life in a much too significant way. Like, in a way, it's just something I have lived with and lived around and dealt with. As an adult, I don't have the experience of not living with it to compare it with. I don't really have a before and after. It gave me so much strength that I didn't know was there. And I wouldn't lose it for quids, and I certainly wouldn't go back to being the person I was before. Although I, there wasn't anything bad about the person I was before. The person I am now is far more confident. Something to do at my very core of who I am that was eating away at me with the cancer, and I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. I couldn't really go back to who I was before. You know, that was a different person. It's a wonderful way of cutting through the bullshit. We realise with a vengeance that there's another side to life that we hadn't even explored. And it's a quick way in to the other side of yourself. It's violent, this way in. It's vicious and deadly, but by God, you get there. <laughs> <laughs>